Uh, probably let's begin. Hi, Huda. Let's begin so if um, everyone agrees. Yes. So hello to everyone and thank you so much for being with us uh, this afternoon, this morning for Joanna, uh, be it in person or uh, remotely. And so Darmenio and I are really delighted uh, to be in the presence uh, of uh, two special speakers for our Imarxist seminar, Joanna Drucker and uh, Valerie Schaffer. I will begin by presenting the first speaker who will give a talk entitled Ethics and Semiotics of Visualizing Archives Through Interfaces. And then we'll have 20 minutes for discussion. Afterward, I will give the floor to Enzo for the presentation of our second guest here with us in Liège, Valérie Schaffer. Joanna Drucker is currently the Martin and Bernard Breslauer Professor at the Department of Information Studies at UCLA. She is a widely known scholar, not only in the USA, but all around Europe and in various fields of humanistic research, art history, digital art history, visual culture, epistemology, the digital humanities, she can be more generally described as a philosopher. Last but not least, she is an important commentator of semiotic theory and especially of French school semiotics. A twofold example can be found in her work on visual knowledge. For her, as for Bartesian semiotics, not only does visuality have the ability to convey a complex discourse on the world, but also on the visual itself. In this sense, we can say that she's a partner along the path of semiotics, from Benveniste era to the current material turn of semiotics. In fact, in her analysis of painting, photography, or graphic design, she explains that the visuality always implies a metavisual level and an enunciative level. The image is able to express a reflection on itself and on the process that made this image possible. She also insists in her work on the fact that the digital code is not abstract or pure, but is a kind of writing inscribed in the materialities of recording media, following in the steps of the constructivist approach of Nelson Goodman's epistemology. In this respect, uh, very innovating is the recent book we presented last October, the recording of which is available on the website of our Center for Semiotics and Rhetorics. The title of the book is uh, Visualization and Interpretation, Humanistic Approaches to Display, in Press 2020. It is a crucial book on data visualization, which makes us understand that data visualization is indeed the result of a very long process of working on data, what she calls the life cycle of data. Uh, this work is... Uh, Unfortunately, unfortunately, often concealed by the designer. She proposes a renewed way of visualizing data, one that is able to show contradiction between data, those entailing instability and epistemic uncertainty about the degree of trust that we can put on them. Joanna uh, has authored a large number of books. Uh, I'd like to mention uh, the very important graphics, the Visual Forms of Knowledge Production, published in 2014, which is on visual epistemology and uh, which addresses a large spectrum of images uh, ranging from medieval painting to data visualizations, as well as uh, uh, other books on typography and uh, contemporary art, 
such as the Century of Artists Books and the Alphabetic Labyrinth of uh, um, the Letters in History and Imagination, both published in 1995, in addition to the Visible World, Experimental Typography and Modern Art, published in 1994. She's also known in the art world as a book artist and as a sketch artist. Her work as a book artist has been exhibited uh, in universities, libraries, galleries, and museums uh, throughout the world. Uh, we have to say that her theories on visual uh, knowledge have always found the field of uh, experimentation, observation, and theorization in the art practices. The latest book of uh, Joanna is uh, Ilias, a meta, uh, meta um, biography of a modernist published in 2021 about the visual poet uh, Ilias, who began his career in the pre-revolutionary artistic circles of Russian Futurism. In this book, Drucker addresses questions about the relation between documentary evidence and narrative, between contemporary witnesses and uh, in retrospective accounts. Finally, for the French speaking audience, a book is available and it is, it's entitled Visualisation, l'interpretation modélisante in the book series Esthétique des données, published in 2020. I'm really, really delighted to, to have uh, Joanna with us uh, today and uh, I give uh, her floor for the beginning of uh, her talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marianne, and so for having me here. I'm going to share my screen and uh, begin this PowerPoint. So give me one second and we will begin. Excellent. You can see everything just fine. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to speak a bit about the ethics and semiotics of visualizing archives through interface. That's quite a few things to put together. Um, and in some ways, the semiotic aspect of this will be a bit light, um, but the issues of, of how we understand and read um, an, an archive as an interface and through an interface um, should raise issues of um, signification and how we understand the tropes and metaphors um, in the signs of the archive. And here is a, a bit of the shelf of the Vatican, uh, Vatican secret archive. And this, I think, conjures the, the kind of basic metaphors and tropes of what we think of when we conjure the concept of archive into our minds, right? It's old and crumbling papers, it's things that are put on shelves, it's things that have a kind of, you know, mystery to them or aura kind of antiquarian quality. And so, you know, we could read these images as well as material properties of these um, artifacts and arrangements for all of the way in which they signify archive, right? And, you know, the old parchment, the seals, the various kinds of handwritings, the, you know, physical material properties participate to such a degree in the image of the archive that they're almost cliches. I mean, if you, you think about somebody making a Da Vinci Code movie, they will, you know, think, oh, parchment and wax seals and obscure handwriting. So again, these are, these are signifying properties that become tropes, become cliches and so forth um, in, our, in our picturing of the archive. Now, in fact, most archives are a little bit more like this, um, not quite the Da Vinci Code. Um, and uh, this is the Smithsonian and the kind of bureaucratic managerial um, signification that you see here is more typical of the standard um, archive. If we're thinking about archives in the deeper sense of the, um, you know, the records of institutions, administrations, administrative units. And this is really where the profession of archives comes into being as diplomatics, um, which is in a, a, you know, a role of stewardship and custody for records that are historical records. And they're generally the historical records of a state, of a nation, of an administrative unit. 
Um, and there are various kinds of, um, you know, again, protocols that go along with the management of these records. Here we see the Archiv National, um, and again, conjuring these, um, you know, sort of images of the venerable building, the repository, the carefully stewarded, organized, and arranged, um, or you know, uh, materials uh, displayed here on their shelves. Now, the profession of, ar of archives, uh, the archival profession has very specific understanding of archives, which I've just mentioned, which is the idea of the records of an administrative unit, of a state, of a court, um, you know, of, a, of an organization. And therefore, there are various kinds of, of um, in professional um, skills and protocols that have to do with the way in which materials are accessed, um, acquired, um, assessed, and organized or arranged that also carry with them signification at the meta level. In other way, words, the way that something is organized is not merely a convenience for access, but carries with it an epistemological value-laden structure um, that gives the materials, um, you know, extra information beyond what resides in their documentary identity. Now, as uh, digital uh, scholars, uh, scholars practicing work in the digital uh, domain and even in the more analog domain um, have, you know, uh, become engaged with uh, papers of various important figures or um, historical projects. The concept of archive has started to get used very loosely. And here, the Walt Whitman archive, an, an admirable piece of scholarship in all regards, very, very scholarly, very well done, very carefully uh, managed and organized, um, presents itself as an archive. From the point of view of a professional archivist, this is not an archive. This is a collection. Um, so again, why the term archive? What is the what is the kind of authority that that term itself carries as a sign, so that it it, it gets a kind of gravitas to it? Um, now here again, the way that, that we could talk about this particular interface, the way in which the organization of the archive um, is presented for use. Um, it's very different than what's happening behind the scenes within the digital organization and the information architecture. So when we think about an interface, we're thinking both about physical interface as in this sense, right? That the building is an interface, the shelves are an interface, but we'll also be thinking about the way in which digital interfaces are organized and functioned, uh, organized and function. So here we see things organized by theme or type, right? Published works, handwritten works, life and letters, commentary. So again, it's a kind of typology of components that exist within this repository that are being presented according to a particular intellectual structure. These are interpretive structures um, to be sure um, and uh, much debate goes into thinking about how they should communicate the contents of the repository. Um, but again, an archivist would say this is not an archive, it's a collection, it's a repository. The distinction matters only in so far as some of, again, the kind of professional protocols that belong to archival practices um, come into a bit of kind of, you know, uh, question in the organization of a project like this. Now, what about these interfaces? Here we have the Online Archive of California, and again, I think question of whether this is an archive or merely a collection or repository um, is uh, up for debate. Um, but this is an excellently organized resource. It has a tremendous amount of material in it from California institutions, collections, um, rare materials, primary materials, and it's um, you know very easy to navigate and it's clearly organized. So one of the things you notice immediately here is that you have instructions for the user, browse, 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 right? Or get help. So in other words, there's a whole set of behaviors that of a user that are supported by the um, instructions in the interface. 
So the interface appears to be flat. It faces us. Um, it seems to be transparent. It's meant to provide the smoothest possible access to the online archive. And you can search here from A to Z and move through, and then you access primary materials, secondary materials, and so forth. This is a kind of quintessential, you know, perfect archive interface for a digital environment um, on many levels. We'll talk in a minute about all the things that it doesn't do and that it doesn't um, it, it announce about its own identity. And to do that, we need to go back to thinking about, you know, the relationship between physical archives and digital presentations. This is the physical storage area of the Internet Archive in 2016. And you see how physical it is, how, you know, it's this giant warehouse with metal shelves and tons of stuff. And this is the Internet Archive as you encounter it online. So, again, what is that relationship? What is the what? aspects of what is contained within a physical archive as it is remediated into digital format do not show in the digital interface. Um, and the answer is many, many things, of course, um, do not show. But if we're going to talk about interface here, um, I want to talk about the fundamental sort of structuring activity of interface as well as signifying activities of interface. We need to go back and think just for a minute about the fundamentals of what an interface does and how it functions. So this is the you know, very early version of the flight simulator, the cockpit module. And again, it's interesting because it has both a flat area of dashboard here, and it has a kind of perspectival point of view that is uh, simulating the experience of somebody in flight in an early, very pixelated uh, mode. But what's significant here, again, if we contrast it with this or this, is that here at the bottom, we have that flat facing aspect of the interface. It says, these are things you, in this case, it's a dashboard. There are things you can do. Um, but the flight simulator also recognizes through its structure, its perspectival structure, that someone is looking, that there's a subject, that there's a constructed enunciated subject of this particular um, screen environment. And that is the thing that um, typically a digital interface does not do. It does not acknowledge the enunciative function and the kind of subject construction that it participates in. It flattens that out and erases it. But when we go back to early flight simulation, um, you know, we see this and then again, it disappears as we move into the world of desktop metaphors or Windows metaphors that again flat, flatten out the screen environment um, into a sort of, you know, an, an image that faces us and supports activity um, or supports a view into the contents of a particular computer environment, archive, collection, repository, and so forth. Um, so when we move into the, the, the present um, sort of highly professional domain of archives and look the way interfaces are designed for them, this is truly an archive, it's the National Archives of the United States. Um, again, we see that there are you know, ways to um, expose what ap appears to be the contents of the archives. But of course, to some extent that is um, you know, a, a, a skin, a, a kind of metaphoric superstructure that is put onto a very elaborate information architecture that ultimately contains files. But, um, you know, each one of these um, panels can lead us into any number of pathways, often to materials that are shared in terms of the root. These are not actually separate domains, but they are shared points of entry into access, right? But again, this very flat, very well organized. I mean, again, this is you know highly professional work. There's everything about it is um, efficient and functions, and functions with a kind of apparent transparency. Here again, the signifying aspect is almost meant to disappear um, in, and be replaced by a highly functional, transparent interface. The interface is meant to, in a sense, go away. 
Now, this idea of the interface going away is part of the whole theory of interface. I show you the very famous image by Jesse James Garrett. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but um, this uh, particular diagram is much cited in the interface um, literature and with good reason because Garrett was really pointing out that there's a major distinction to be made between an interface that um, shows the contents of um, you know, a repository or site and an interface that simply supports user experience so that, the, that someone can you know, find, search, um, and in most cases buy uh, something in the online environment. Now, theory of interface has its own entire history, theoretical complexity. And again, we start to see all kinds of interesting metaphors um, and again, signifying systems here. Um, you know, here's the open systems interconnection model of interface, and it contains what we would call a stack. So again, the concept of the stack as a metaphor, as a trope to understand information architecture is itself an elaborated science system, um, even though it references a whole set of software, hardware, and networked um, you know, features of that system. You know, again, the, the literature on interfaces elaborate and highly developed here, are the 10 commandments of user interface design. Now, if we were to take time to go through these, which you know we do when we're designing an interface or teaching these things, what you would come to in the end, uh, the whole sum of this particular screen is to, again, make the interface effectively disappear, make it so intuitive and so easy that it conforms to the eight golden rules of interface design articulated by Ben Schneiderman. Now, Schneiderman was one of the pioneers in human computer interface and did you know, all kinds of very interesting projects from early on um, of the networked environment, even pre-networked environment. But Schneiderman and, Sch Schneiderman and I've had our, our kind of over the years because in my opinion, what Schneiderman's work moves towards is this kind of perfect transparency. Right, the interface is that which supports activity but does not call attention to itself. And again, I go back to the National Archives here as a perfect example um, of something executed according to these golden rules. Now, I consider this to be a consumerist model of subject activity. In other words, this is about making it easy to search, find, retrieve, and get what you want. So in that sense, it's based on, you know, a kind of um, consumer satisfaction survey, right? It's like, that's what the archive is for. And again, plenty of good arguments for this in terms of what the, um, archive, what the um, interface can do and how it can function. But is there an ethical issue here? Is there a problem in the apparent transparency in the ease of access in the consumer model. There's been a lot of discussion in um, archival studies about a consumerist approach to serving up materials from collections. And should there be more of a kind of, you know, negotiation in the process of access, something that calls awareness to, you know, what's going on and what's being delivered. Um, I want to just make one uh, small point of distinction as I'm showing you this messy little Gmail site. And that is to say that an, an interface should be distinguished from a dashboard. A dashboard, this is a kind of primitive dashboard. This is a more elaborate dashboard and a very, again, sophisticated one. Um, a dashboard is designed to take live feeds of data and make them available for integration across a whole bunch of different analytics and functionalities so that you get a, you know, a kind of overview of multiple streams of integrated uh, data feed. It's an interface as well, but a dashboard does more things than an interface. An interface really is a kind of scrim or screen that provides access to a collection or repository. Um, this does not provide access to the collection. It provides a display space for complex live stream analytics that are ongoing. 
um, and dashboards are used in industry, they're used in supply chains, they're used in you know, traffic management and control. So again, they have a different function, um, a, high, a different level of functionality than an interface. An interface can actually be fairly static. It has interaction in it, but it doesn't have to be changing. It can be built and, and remain in place without um, having live feed uh, in it. Now, um, the, the Hopkins uh, dashboard is really interesting on many levels. Again, very sophisticated, highly useful, very, um, you know, uh, sort of easy to, easy to use in the sense that you can get information from it um, without, you know, it's fairly intuitive to use. But one of the issues that it raises against a fundamental ethical issue that's part and parcel of all statistical and data analytics with regard to human conditions, suffering, and tragedy is that Hopkins erases the human face of what's going on in COVID. And um, uh, Kim Gallen, um, who's a, an activist, digital um, humanist, um, was very perturbed, and rightfully so, by the uh, asymmetries and inequities that were quickly apparent as the COVID epidemic spread through different demographics and populations. And she established this particular site, COVID Black, um, in order to put a human face on health data. And again, we think about, okay, you know, what's missing here, what's present here, and you know, to what extent can we use an interface to call attention to aspects of the human experience that are erased in the kind of, you know, sort of smoothly functioning interfaces that get put onto, um, you know, websites of public, you know, even with public information and so forth. Um, there are many things to talk about here, and among them is um, compassion fatigue and what happens at, at scale. But um, the contrast here between Hopkins and COVID Black is uh, makes an important point about the problematic aspects of, of an interface based on data based on human uh, suffering, illness, and catastrophe. Now, Mitchell Whitelaw, who's a very interesting uh, designer and digital humanist and, and theoretician, has been uh, you know involved in any number of experimental projects to rethink ways in which the contents of repositories and archives can be exposed for user you know for, uh, for search and retrieval. Um, this is the Irish and History History Wall. This was a project developed by Tim Sherratt for the National Museum of Australia. And again, thinking back to the National Archives image with its clean menu bands and so forth, and then looking at this, we see the difference, right? Color coding, nice, you know, highly aesthetic choices, presentation of primary materials in miniature, um, a timeline. There are many structuring elements and information rich elements present here, neatly distinguished by, again, the graphic organization so that we can get access to it. We, we can see into the archive, we can see into the repository in a vivid way. Um, other projects that Whitelaw calls to our attention in his um, discussion of what he calls generous interfaces, and again, I believe that's his term, um, is um, here's another, this is the all artists interface prototype, again, for prints and printmaking. How do you give a user a sense of what it is that they are looking for? What, what, what are the affordances that are supported um, by data and metadata that can be graphically um, you know, displayed for, uh, to expose? Um, so here we have something that is not quite so transparent, right? It doesn't fully erase itself as an interface. Instead, it says, here's some things an interface can do to show you um, more of what's present in the repository. And uh, here's another of the projects that Whitelaw called to attention. And this is interesting because of its cross correlation. Um, we have a decade browser on the left, and then we have prints, and then we have individual works that featured in the center. So again, what correlations are happening here? The interface is not just exposing, in a sense, what the contents of the collection might be, but it's also calling on the structured data as an integral part of the way in which that interface um, functions and therefore exposes that metadata is part of 
you know, what we could know um, in getting to know a repository or archive. So this is important because the politics of metadata um, are so highly charged in terms of, you know, authority files and, uh, you know, um, the standards and so forth. So really interesting to look at. And we might even consider in a thought experiment, what would a culturally faceted browser rather than a decade browser look like? So if we were looking, saying that we want access to an archive like the National Gallery of Australia through a faceted lens of cultural perspectives, what would that look like? What kind of ethical issues would that address? So um, as I move towards the kind of final uh, sort of parts of, of my remarks here, um, I just, again, invoke the National Archives once more as this kind of official um, face of archival activity. This is, you know, the repository of record for the United States and its interface is meant to be as transparent as possible. Now, one of the principles of uh, archival studies is that what an archive like this, a true archive should preserve, is the original order of the materials. In other words, the sequence in which they were produced and the administrative units from which, uh, to which they belong and from which they emerge. Now, if you go into this National Archive, you will see, um, again, in highly professional language, um, a description of this arrangement of this organization and of the contents as a kind of, you know, again, recognition of prof <coughs> professional protocols. Well, that works great, except when the original order is actually disorder. And, you know, um, I have to say, um, this is not an unfamiliar site in uh, institutions, organizations, and even personal papers and, and collections. Um, and uh, I'll spare you the details of, you know, vermin carcasses and, and, and so forth. But that has been part of my, not in my own archive, I will say, but in, in, in assisting, um, you know, uh, community organizations and individuals with their archives. Um, so the original disorder. Now, if we actually follow through the archival recommendation that, you know, the um, organization of information is part of the information itself, then what kind of interface are these, you know, scenes? Because they also contain a whole palimpsestic archaeology of their production that is part of the information um, that is present. So physical space as an interface raises a bunch of other issues. Do we clean it up? Do we organize it? Do we impose a structure? These are all decisions that are part of the interpretive work of creating an archive through another interface. So what is that interface concealing? And of course, as we know, not everything gets saved, not everything can be saved. Um, lots of archival material ends up in the trash or shredded, or as per our favorite scandal of last week, torn up and put in the toilet. So since when did plumbing, when did we start having a plumbing interface to the archive, right? You know, it's like, partly I'm being facetious and partly I'm not, you know, it's the, there's a sense in which all of these physical environments participate in the production and destruction of the historical record. So um, as we come to the end then, um, I wanna to touch on just a couple of uh, uh, ethical concerns. Um, on the one hand, archives, repositories, collections, records, historical documents to be preserved, right? The preservation of the historical record. On many levels, this seems to be a useful and positive notion and these transparent interfaces that seem to perform effectively in their consumerist and professional models seem to carry a kind of, you know, value neutral, um, you know, sort of quality to them. But of course they don't. And we know that. And in many ways, the efficient operation of an interface participates in many um, aspects of abuse. There are many liabilities to the way in which information can be accessed and used. So here are FBI um, records. Um, not every community wants its records and its materials to be fully apparent, to be fully um, accessible. Mukurtu was a, a, a customizable site developed for, um, in particular, for working with indigenous materials and in communities 
who wanted to put various kinds of access limits onto their digital repositories. Um, and so recur to sites um, have proliferated, you know, with uh, quite successfully, um, you know, there's another indigenous archives.org. Again, the question of, no, not everything should be fully apparent. Not, not every interface should, should offer access equally to all members of the public. There should be, you know, zones and domains, community archives. There are liabilities for having uh, materials fully accessible, as we will see in just a moment. So again, communities um, and community archives that are, you know, working to control their own records and materials have become, you know, much more established um, in recent years as a way to think about how the archive of both physical space and digital environment does and doesn't reveal, you know, all that is, you know, uh, sort of part of those collections. So there's an ethics to transparency um, and an ethics to limiting uh, transparency as well as access um, in these archives. And, you know, a couple of good examples of this include, um, for instance, the QZAP zine archive, a rather venerable um, archive of gay and lesbian materials. And um, you know, with many caveats involved, these are materials that were made often in a zine context, which meant they were meant to circulate in a community, form community, serve the purpose of individuals who were working through issues of identity and, and through relationship to community, but they weren't necessarily meant to be co collected and they weren't necessarily meant to be cataloged. So again, the archive as a point of access to metadata becomes an ethical issue when you realize that you can now browse by people and places and years. So someone whose identity as a queer, out, gay, trans, or bi person might not have been something they wanted to have be public or that might have been a phase or, you know, a transition period for them, um, you know, are now identified in metadata. So again, there's a whole ethics to the way in which the structuring environment of the interface, you know, signs, right, the identity of someone through these metadata categories and so forth. So again, there's many liabilities here. Um, lost archives, found archives, again, bringing things to the surface that were part of historical um, phenomena that have been obscured or lost. Um, you know, this is from the Pittsburgh Courier, and again, the search for the lost archives, bringing these materials forward, would seem to be a very positive contribution for archivists and historians. But again, liabilities exist. This is a very famous project, the Belfast Project at Boston College. And um, this contained, um, you know, interviews and archival material from the period of the uh, Irish Troubles and and um, and and you know very specific information about individuals who had been complicit with the British troops and the British government, um, and so the Belfast Project contained sealed materials. The United Kingdom subpoenaed the Belfast Project for these materials. And again, this raised all kinds of issues about how the interface was exposing, um, you know, points of access that needed in a sense to be kept protected and sealed and private. So again, the, the dual side of, of the interface as a point of access and a point of, of control and limitation. So as I finish up here, um, you know, I want to, um, you know, sort of call attention to the sort of larger framework and dimension of archival practice. I've talked from the repository and the collection, the physical interface, the digital interface, documents, records, liabilities, and how they work. And almost all of that remains framed within a sense that the archive is a kind of autonomous space, a framed space, a space apart, a space that functions as um, a collection of materials, um, whether they are accessed in a physical way or through an intermediary or, or some kind of interface. This is an image from the Stasi archive. Um, and again, classic 
crumbling papers, you know, the, 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 the documents, the kind of massive amount of documents. But the documents don't function and wouldn't have existed if they were not part of a social network and system. And here in what I think is a really chilling kind of picture is an image of a Stasi, an office at the Stasi, um, now the Stasi Museum. Um, and, you know, things like these odor um, felts that were taken off of chairs after people were there for interviews that were then used for to signal to dogs in other semiotics here, signal to dogs um, the identity of an individual person so they could be tracked and the, the kind of bureaucratic, quote, neutrality of the interface of these um, card catalogs, very familiar kind of image of the bureaucratic, administrative, you know, Stasi, you know, sort of uh, compulsive, um, obsessive uh, inventorying of information. Margaret Hedstrom, who's a, a, an archivist in the professional archive community, talks a lot about interface as a kind of intermediary um, as a structure that, you know, sort of contains an elaborate set of signs and metaphors for how we understand what archives are, how they function, what they contain, and how they can be used. If we were to spend time reading this room and reading these elements as signifiers, what they lead to as an interface, this is an interface to an archive, to its site of production, um, is that they show us that it's not really that the, it's that the, the concept of the archive um, does not reside simply in its documents and in the management of its materials, but in the way in which if we flip this around, these all of these things lead back into the elaborate social systems that enable their functionality, that this room is in a sense, the interface at that point of intersection between what becomes this and what is, you know, the world from which that material is extracted and drawn. So again, here the, the, the office space becomes the kind of interface intermediary with all of its metaphors of apparent bureaucratic neutrality, administrative efficiency. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I've gone a little bit too long um, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Joanna. It was uh, it was really exciting. I would like to to give the floor to the participants uh, remotely and here, but uh, I would like probably to um, to ask you something. Um, if we um, uh, come back to the opposition transparency opacity uh, by by Wimaran, um, I would like to ask you: Do you think that uh, op um, opacity is more ethical than transparency. Um, uh, in which sense opacity? Not only in the fact that the uh, enunciative level is uh, shown and problematized, uh, um, because in transparency, uh, in um, websites that are transparent, like uh, for the COVID, uh, John Hopkins, Hopkins COVID, eh? So it's completely it's completely uh, homogeneous. Not not only tra it's transparent because it's homogeneous in the sense the translations of uh, faces, uh, situations, emotions, and so on have been um, have been unified uh, in a in a two um, a two homogeneous uh, material. So I think that in the opacity, uh, there is ethical, more ethical uh, uh, epicer because of the multimodality and the multimateriality that uh, is kept. Um, and in this sense, I think that the stratification you, you, you showed through the rooms and through the physical, uh, uh, physical um, arrangement and organization of uh, materials have to be transposed. This, uh, uh, this uh, stratification has to be transposed in, uh, in websites. And for doing this, uh, I think that uh, it's important to, to respect the, the different materials, such as photography, for instance, because it's so easy to, uh, to conceal the aura uh, of, uh, of photography 
So every photograph is uh, is like the other in a, in a website, but uh, I think that it would be important to. Um, uh, to, to, to be able to preserve uh, um, this uh, area of time, uh, for instance, in showing different uh, materials uh, through digital, uh, uh, digital uh, um, interfaces. So are you, are you, uh, do you agree that um, opacity is more ethical uh, because of these uh, multiple uh, materialities? Well, you know, on, on some level, yes, right, of course, um, in the sense that, you know, opacity at least calls attention to the madeness of the, you know, of the systems. And so I think the question of ethics always has to do with to what extent can we call attention to whose interests are served by a particular system? Um, you know, in, in whose interests is it um, for something to be easy to access? And in whose interest is it for something to have to be accessed through a set of protocols or requests or difficulties? So, you know, I mean, it's, it, these things are very difficult to answer in a kind of, you know, absolute because it's really going to depend on the, the circumstance. So, you know, if I'm trying to access emergency services because, I have a sick child and who's having, I mean, and there's a time limit on how, how much, you know, where that window of, you know, uh, survival is, then you don't want opacity in that interface. But if it's a matter of a betting interface that allows people to keep betting endlessly across the course of a Super Bowl game without any checks or obstacles that say, hey, you're now way over the limit you set, you know, it's like, so in whose interest is it for something to be easy and for something to be difficult? But I think when we're dealing with the historical record um, and we're dealing with the kind of materials that as humanists we are concerned with, um, I do think that the, the kind of leveling that you're talking about, it's, it's really important that we, you know, keep in mind what the materiality is, what the, what the costs are of the making of the storing of the, you know, it's like every image is not equal and yet on the screen it appears to be. Um, and so I think there's, you know, a lot of information that gets lost, but there's a lot of embeddedness within human costs and human labor and community values and and so forth that also I think it it starts to be difficult to recover um, you know so I, I think again there's there's ways to think about how we call attention to um, the you know sort of values that are embedded in those interface structures that we tend just to look through. We, you know, the windows metaphor, we look through to the materials instead of looking at the structuring devices. So, you know, what is that metadata? How's it structured? How, how's it call certain things to attention? Group them. Um, so, uh, so again, there's no, as you know, as you know, there's no easy answer, <laughs> right? Um, there's no single answer to all of these uh, different interfaces and circumstances. Yes, yes thank you. Thank you. Um, someone has wanted to um, ask a question to Joanna from remotely. Enzo. Um, here we are uh, thank you Joanna for the presentation always nice uh, I'm uh, I like very much the way in which you are able to put together data visualization uh, interface design uh, and uh, this uh, this uh, uh, argument about the virtuality and the materiality of our archives is very interesting. So my question is a little bit provocative because lately we are talking a lot about this metaverse and 
know I'm a member of the Meta Lab, so we had this discussion with Jeffrey Snap about this. So I was wondering if you, uh, as uh, if you have uh, some thoughts about uh, this, uh, uh, the potentiality of the metaverse for archives, if you have ideas in this sense, and yeah, just this. Thank you. All right, so I, I'm gonna. When you talk about the metaverse, um, so I, two things come to mind, and I'm curious what's in your mind. On the one hand, I have this kind of like, you know, the madman global access to all things at all times, you know, the kind of mabuza, you know, the sort of now I, right, okay, there, there's that aspect of the metaverse. But then there's also the augmented reality aspect. It, it, are you including the whole sort of AR? VR sort of um, experience when you're invoking the metaverse? Uh, I mean, uh, an answer in both direction is very appreciated. In my mind, it's uh, it's more related uh, to virtual reality. And it is. can do with uh, archives, uh, yes. Yes. OK, so um, all right. So we'll let the madman go for a moment. <laughs> send them off. Um, but, you know, the one of the questions that one of my colleagues at Virginia used to always ask when we started talking about building interfaces and building things was, you know, to what extent is it really useful to invest in simulating in a digital environment the properties of a physical environment? You know, is it worth the overhead, right? What's the cost? Um, you know, the cognitive load as well as the, you know, computational load as well as the environmental load. I mean, the cost of the environmental cost, as we know, of building these systems is, is huge, right? I mean, we know that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency absorb more energy than the city of London. Okay, so, you know, there's an ethics there that we need to be, I think, aware of um, until we get our bicycle powered, um, you know, systems and can, can sit in and, and, you know, Right, right. Our, uh, out the, uh, you know, generate enough energy to, to power our little VR systems. Um, but the question is, you know, what's the VR do? And I know, you know, I have no interest in VR. I'll put it very bluntly. You know, those systems are to me like games. They're 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 they they trivialize um, and kind of overbuild what I can grasp much more quickly in an intellectual structure. Um, I'm more interested in the intellectual structures. And again, they simulate the so-called real, right? So, you know, it's like, why bother when I can, you know, if I go to the online archive of California, I can read through a list of repositories or search materials through metadata structures really quickly. I don't need to be in a pleasure palace of, you know, our memory palace of, you know, the simulated, you know, Borges library in order to, to have that experience. So, you know, I guess, you know, for me, it's of, of no interest, but no doubt for many people, it's, it's a wonderful, exciting, you know, game experience of how to encounter culture. Um, have you spent much time in VR? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, but uh, I remember when I was at the MIT, there were there were a lot of people interested at uh, at this subject. So uh, um, I started to explore a little bit of data visualization in 3D. I have uh, the same uh, um, feeling you have. I mean, um, why to replicate again? And uh, I'm still waiting something interesting in, in this field. Uh, yeah. Maybe with uh, Oculus, uh, we can have a more deeply, um, a, a more intense uh, uh, environment uh, to interact with. Uh, but uh, I was just uh, thinking that maybe the virtual environment is uh, something between uh, the two worlds you are discussing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess we'll see, you know, whether or not there are features of, you know, again, interpretive activity, intellectual engagement that can be built within that environment that aren't simply a replication of the physical, but also impose, you know, various kinds of interpretive schema from an intellectual point of view into those environments as well. I mean, it's, it remains to be seen, really. 
I mean, we haven't yet really built the multifaceted multiverse that digital humanities originally thought was going to be part of our work. We've remained very much in kind of hierarchical systems, single standards, and so forth. Well, anyway, there's other questions, but um, thank you for raising the VR issue and letting me seem like a crank because I just don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And we have uh, three more questions. Okay. Gustavo Gomez. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you if uh, uh, we get back to Maria Julia's introduction. She was talking about your book on Ilias, and I wanted to ask if both topics both topics intersect. If by working on the Ilias productions, you went to encounter culture through digital archives of his works. Uh, like the, the question I'm wondering, I was wondering if you think like social media platforms are kind of um, to be considered as a more lively archives, even though they can bring a consumerist approach to serving collections. I was wondering because I, I, I was checking for Ilias on Instagram and you get to see uh, Etsy t-shirts being sold. And it's it's a part of an archive, it's a living archive. So I was wondering about the, how these two subjects intersect. Uh, it's a wonderful question. I'm not sure I can answer it succinctly or briefly, but I will say that, you know, my original engagement with Ilias as a research topic came when I met his widow and was able to work with her in his archives. And I had never had an experience like that. And it was transformative and magical and engaging um, to actually be handed, you know, materials that were from the early part of the century. And um, so the fact that, you know, everything gets commodified and spread all over the place in internet environments and turned into t-shirts and cups and other <laughs> things, you know, that's, you know, the opportunism of, the, uh, of our current world. But, you know, it allows people to to know about things and, and, and feel identified with culture in ways that, you know, hopefully will lead them into a deeper understanding of the value of the work of somebody like Elias. You know, why not? So, yeah. But it's interesting that you bring all of that up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I would like to say that I haven't read the, the last, the latest book of Joanna. But um, having read the other ones, and especially visualization and interpretation, I think that a common um, characteristic, a common feature, can be the fact that uh, Joanna um, wants, uh, in my opinion, uh, always to show the heterogeneity of the origin of the sources of documents as experiences of documents. Yeah. I think that your metabiography um, um, tries to be like uh, the, um, the the data displays that you that you uh, that you proposed in the visualization and uh, ex uh, interpretation book. Uh, so very um, the, the, the heterogeneity and the stratification and the relations between uh, different experiences of different. Uh, of different um, documents has to appear, has to appear to the to the audience, and this is an ethical uh, yes. instrument. Um, so, uh, but it, it was effectively a very interesting uh, question. So, Huda um, uh, Lankadam, and and we should wrap up so we can give the floor to Valerie. I'm worried about not cutting into her time. Yes. So. Yes, yes, but we have um, um, uh, four or five minutes because you, you okay, can great. Perfect. Five, okay. but you can at, uh, so we have um, four or five more minutes. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Of course, this was quite a, a enriching and thought provoking uh, talk. So I, I wanted, I wanted to kind of go back to the topic of uh, ethics and its relationship to the uh, well, the transparency and uh, opacity discussion. I'm quite interested in the um, the concept of the invisibility of designers in web interfaces <laughs> and in dashboards. I think that's something that 
has a lot of effects on this, yeah, quote unquote, transparency, um, because of course things look neutral and look kind of pure and holy and artificial because in any kind of physical artifact, in any kind of artwork, for instance, you know that someone made it and therefore you can agree or disagree with it, you can have thoughts on it. Um, and that's not the case for a lot of web interfaces, especially the very institutional ones that you show that all look yeah, yeah. very finished yeah. and pure. So do you think that there is yeah, some an effect or that we could try to salvage this by bringing in or vi yeah, visibilizing maybe um, the designers in web interfaces? That's a great um, comment, I have to say, Huda. And I think it's not just um, indicating the designers, but I think also the whole sort of like who is speaking in an interface, because the designer is probably not the author, but the designer is the, you know, sort of engineer of experience. So, you know, so I think it's that whole chain of accountability, who is speaking, that needs to be exposed um, in, in interfaces, and it disappears entirely um, in most cases. So, yeah, so I think the designer has a very important role there um, in terms of how that experience works and what it shows and doesn't show or provide access to. Um, but I do think the, the larger question here is who is speaking and how do we show, you know, that, you know, sort of uh, authorship chain and the authority chain that it's linked mm -hmm. to. Who has authority to speak? Yeah, yeah, it's a whole pipeline that is a bit a bit hidden there from the conversation. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the last question, Everardo. Okay, thank you. Really, do you have time? Okay. Yes, yes, two okay. minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> okay, so. make it let's have a quick. So, so thank you, Joanna. Uh, uh, it's always very interesting talk. So I think it's related to the last question as well. So I think that uh, what would you what what are your thoughts about also this kind of flattening of uh, interfaces to access archives because as you said of course we have standards norms uh, we mainly use doubling core for metadata or it's expected to 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 do that so many systems are designed onto uh, those uh, recommendations so uh, we accept that sometimes um, it's uh, given for taken for granted that we we should construct this according to those um expectations so uh, sometimes also we maybe forget that some data is consumed by non-human agents there are many robots and bots of the web so it's a kind of intercooperation between uh, humans and, and and machines right so my question is okay so do you have a uh, have you continued working on some other examples of interfaces that rescue different values that would be mainly subjective? Because I, I know you have work on what you call aesthetic provocations. Uh, so yeah, uh, that would be my yeah. question. You know, I mean, Everardo, I wish I could say yes, that I have the perfect solution for you, which is the perspectival multifaceted interface that is, you know, sort of self-consciously um, calling attention to its enunciative um, apparatus. So, but if you'd like to build it for me, I'd be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could get Dario to do that instead of getting pulled into the matrix multiverse metaverse. <laughs> so, but no, I mean, I do think, you know, these are these are questions that are not the, the, the solutions here do not have technological obstacles to them. They have only, you know, the obstacles of in whose interest is it to build such things and what would it, what, what would be the benefit and to whom um, to have these kinds of more self-consciously, um, you know, self-aware uh, tools and platforms. So I think what you're touching on is very important. Um, and, uh, but I wish I could say I had built it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna um, take the, uh, take the back seat here and enjoy Valerie's presentation. Thank you very much, Joanna. Thanks to 
everyone. So Enzo so, will present yeah. uh, Valerie. Uh, yeah, uh, our second invited speaker is Valerie, is Valerie Chastel. Ah, uh, Valerie Schaffer is professor in contemporary European history at the Luxembourg Center for Contemporary Digital History at the University of Luxembourg. She previously worked at the CNRS in France and is still an, an associate researcher at the Center for Internet and Society. Her main research interests are the history of the internet and the web, the history of European digital culture and infrastructure, and more digital heritage, especially web archives. Boris Chappell is the head of the Contemporary European History Research at the Luxembourg Center for Contemporary and Digital History. She is also vice chair of the ICRIA Communication History Section, a member of the Management Committee of the Tension of Europe Network, and general. General Secretary of the Society for History of Media. Uh, she has participated in a long series of research projects in the role of principal, investi principal investigator. I would like to mention two of them because they are close to the themes of this seminar. Analyzing web archives of the COVID crisis through the I IPC Nobel Coronavirus dataset and the ID project, a project running from March 2021 to February 2024, which is supported by the Luxembourg National Research Fund and dedicated to the history of online virality. She's, she's on the editorial board of the journals Le Temps des Médias, Lux and Cahier Francois Viet, and is a co-founder of the journal Internet Histories, Digital Technology, Culture and Society. Her most recent published or co-edited book includes En Construction, La Fabrique Française d'Internet et du Web, in edition 2018, Pensée l'histoire des médias, CNRS edition 2019, et Qu'est-ce qu'une archive du Web, Open edition 2019. I remind you the title of her speech, uh, The Meme Challenges, uh, Virality, Medi Mediatic Dimension and Heritization. Uh, what are you so fair? The, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. I will have the same problem as you with heritageization. It's always a mess, but I don't know why I put it in my title. But uh, thank you for welcoming me. Uh, it's a pleasure. So thank you very much, Maria Julia and Enzo. Thank you also to Joanna for this very stimulating talk. Uh, listening to you, I was thinking um, of governance by design, and you are putting another uh, question there, which is ethics by design, and this is very uh, interesting. And, uh, probably in another way, but uh, my, my talk will also echo a bit yours and we will come back to the Wayback Machine too. And listening to you, there was also this question that uh, arose to my mind when we as historians started to talk about data instead of archives and sources. At some point, we are no more explaining what all archives are, but what all data are. And this is also changing a lot, probably, in our practices and the way we are also looking at, uh, at archives. But let's come to uh, my, the, the question of, of memes and of virality. So of course, uh, all memes are not viral. And virality is not based only on memes. You may have hashtag or other things. I won't uh, give you um, a very yeah, complete definition of uh, memes. I decided to focus more on uh, the question of memes. I just remind you that it came from the book The Selfish Gene by uh, Dawkins in uh, 76. Uh, it's defined as a kind of uh, unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation, but it is also a kind of living structure, we'll come back to it, and it has also uh, be developed after that uh, by uh, what we call memetics, a, a field that was a pioneer in uh, studying uh, memes. So I move, if I succeed, yeah, to some of the books and of the authors that studied uh, memes. So it's a kind of echo that you are trying to, to solve. If I cut the sound of my computer, can they hear me online? I don't know if someone can. I think yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us, um, Joan, Alberto, could you, could you? Can you hear me? 
Could you, can you? Yes, yes of course. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, and Louis, there is, yeah, because the technician asked me to let the microphone open, and I think it's yes. coming from my computer. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry for yes, this, yes. we are we are better now. So, yeah, I was, I come back to Dawkins, but also to some of the books that were really pioneer in studying memes. And uh, it's not very chronological, I would say. Uh, of course, there is Jenkins, and he had also a series of blog posts, a spread or dead. Uh, there was also Limor Schiffman, who uh, really introduced also a lot in uh, these studies related to memes. Uh, we may also uh, quote uh, Kaplan and Nova, Milner, who was also with the World Bank meme, uh, very, very interesting uh, author related to uh, memetics, memes, and so on. And I could, of course, um, quote a lot of other authors, and notably in Europe and in France, like Justine Simon, Albert Wagner, Laura Goudet. Gustavo, who is online, is also very interested in what he is calling uh, les petites formes uh, on the web and on the internet and all these sites uh, and so on. Uh, the work by Gabriele Marino on the Harlem Sheikh and, and so on. So there are a lot of studies related to memes and why do I study memes if there are so many good authors and researchers who are already on the topic? Uh, because as a, an historian of digital cultures, uh, I had the feeling that historians had missed or were not there, that there were a lot of linguists, semioticians, people in communication studies, and so on. And what historians may bring uh, is probably to reintroduce some temporalities, even some spaces, because uh, since Brodel, we are working on the temporalities and entwining them with um, uh, spaces. And so I um, decided to develop this uh, project, uh, which is, yeah, uh, the Ivy uh, project, uh, the story of online virality. But as you mentioned, and so it started just a few months ago. So it's really a work in progress, and I will share. It's even not intermediary results. It's really a, a start into this world, but I hope uh, uh, you, you, you may enjoy it. So why uh, historicizing virality? Because of course it's important, an important part of our uh, digital cultures, and I would say of our vernacular cultures. Uh, a second point is that there are many affordances, changes, circulation that are really uh, challenging. Uh, uh, historians, but also other uh, fields, uh, and uh, that it's a kind of local phenomenon. Uh, as you will see with the Harlem Sheik, it's uh, occurring internationally, but you can have a very, very uh, fine or scalable reading and uh, follow the Harlem Sheik in uh, Limousin, Ardèche, or uh, in every part of the world, and this is quite fascinating. So uh, what we aim to do in this project is also to recover processes and context, to put memes into context, and uh, really uh, into an environment that allows uh, to fully understand their transformation, their changes, their uses, and so on. I'm not sure we will entirely succeed, but we will try. And of course, it's also fascinating because it's a transmedia and transplatform phenomenon. And you will see that it's also quite challenging for uh, historians, and especially when you want to go into uh, the past of uh, these uh, memes. So um, we will start, of course, with uh, early memes, or we already started with early memes. I didn't put the name or the date of this memes, but uh, I don't think we have really time to uh, play and uh, to, uh, but the challenge will be what's the name and what's the date. So I don't know in the room if you want to, if you know all this uh, old meme and the first one, for example, the Godwin's law, it was uh, defined at the beginning of the 90s and uh, Godwin defined it in um, uh, Wired, if I remember well, as a kind of counter meme. And his idea is the more a discussion is developing on, at that time it was not on internet, but on news net, news groups, and so on, the more you have a chance to see a reference to Hitler or to Nazis. It's also related to flame wars. Then you have, of course, the Dancing Baby. It was 96 uh, for the first uh, appearance of the Dancing Baby. 
uh, then you have all the um, days are belong to us, um, 98, and Amsterdam so from a Canadian uh, um, art, art, uh, art student uh, with the music uh, from Disney. You will see that there are a lot of links between, uh, yeah, uh, also um, more traditional media productions and uh, this kind uh, of meme. So there are early stages of, of memes that still that are still used regularly. For example, the uh, gun wins law is still uh, something that people refer on the internet when you have this kind of uh, discussions that are uh, becoming more and more uh, yeah, uh, difficult and uh, yeah. And, touchy. and so there are many forms of memes, and I wanted to give you a, a few examples based on the recall to also show you how um, challenging it may be to recover all the appearance of even one unique meme. So the recall, I especially like it. It, it is based on uh, the song by Rick Ashley that was famous in um, 87, uh, Never Gonna Give You Up. So everybody probably uh, is aware about this song. And recalling, to recall someone, means that you will put uh, an appealing link on, the, on Twitter, on Facebook, or, uh, and people will click on it, expecting something very uh, yeah, stimulating. The first appearance in 2007 was uh, uh, teasing for the video game uh, concept. But instead of your content, you are recrawl, you will see a ricochet appearing and uh, singing, never gonna give you up. So it's uh, full of humor and uh, yeah. As you will see, it may become more serious than uh, we may uh, expect. So, of course, and we were talking uh, yeah, uh, during the lunch about genealogy of images, there were also, or there were previous kind of click roll, like the duck roll that appeared previously. So you can go uh, through several other uh, prongs and jokes and uh, on, the, on the internet, but uh, you can also see that there were several formats or forms of click roll. For example, one was click rolled by a teenager in 2013. You may already imagine the challenge for the historian. Of course, you have press uh, to retrieve it, but why has this appeared? And you have no archive, of course, uh, of uh, why. But you can also find QR code, like in Twitter, I think this QR code may be a recall. You have also on Twitter reference to Spotify and playlist. You have reference to the last, um, the last uh, episode, uh, I don't know, the last uh, yeah, session of uh, Ted Lasso, on Apple TV and so on. So you see a lot of media. Uh, there is Twitter, but there is also references uh, to music, to QR code and so on, to uh, why, but it doesn't stop there. As I told you, it's a trans-platform phenomena, but you also have a lot of yeah, games, creativity related to the recrawl, for example, Rick Ashley uh, in, uh, in Pixel, and you have Apple and advertising, uh, companies are often using the meme cultures, and here it was uh, Apple was recrawling the Apple Watch users on uh, their website. As you can see, never gonna give you up. It's very discreet, but it's a reference also to the people who knows about it. And it's uh, because memes are always between mainstream and marginal, you know, it's uh, coming from 4chan and moving to YouTube and so on. So it's also, yeah, very uh, between the geek and mainstream uh, universe. And yet you have also political uh, affordances of recrawl. For example, Daesh uh, was recrawled by anonymous after uh, the terrorist attacks in, in Paris. And here you can find it and retrieve it through uh, Twitter. Le Rassemblement National by Marine Le Pen in France was also recrawled. So the website was also yeah, uh, recrawled with Never Gonna Give You Up. So you think it's very yeah, light and humorous, and, but it's not just about uh, humor. Then you have also recall in the public sphere and in the physical space, like uh, the Foo Fighters a band who recalled a, a protest against gay people and uh, they uh, entered through 
the demonstration through uh, this uh, protest and recall the uh, yeah uh, this um, anti uh, gay uh, protest by singing the song by Rick Astley. Let me give you another example. Here it is. Yeah, it is if it wants to start. I'm not sure. Yeah, ah, yeah, probably. For the train to the law, you know the rules, and so do I. The full commitments when I'm thinking up. We can get this from any other guy. I just want to tell you how I'm feeling. Make sure you understand. I'm never going to give you up. I'll never let you down. We're not going to run around and desert you. <laughs> but we have a problem with the microphone but what you saw is that in the Oregon speech legislature so uh, all these members they uh, put in their discourses a sentence of never gonna give you up uh, and at the end they provided a video clip on YouTube that became famous so also this is also something which is yeah of course uh, yeah uh, used, of course, which is used by uh, politicians. And finally, to show you how um, you may have many affordances, reappearance, and so on of Rick Freud, I just want to remind you it started in 2007. And here you have, what's your lyrics, uh, COVID uh, advert, uh, advertising. And uh, it's uh, with the song by Rick Ashley, we are no strangers to love, you know the rules and so do I and so on, never gonna let you down. Uh, so you see a lot of reinterpretation, transformation and so on, through text, through uh, drawings in the public sphere, uh, on several platforms. So you may imagine how difficult it is to retrieve this kind of phenomena, this phenomenon and to um, also, uh, find it through times and through uh, yeah several temporalities. So of course uh, you uh, have um, some uh, help uh, thanks to, for example, a recall database which is preserved in the Webex machine, so in uh, Internet Archive. You have also uh, several um, versions of uh, Noyomi, which is a platform which is heritageizing, I will come back to it, uh, means. And so you can also follow how uh, the uh, page related to uh, the recall was uh, enriched. And in several countries, you may use also uh, web archives to follow this uh, phenomenon on a more national level. Here, for example, it is web archives by INA, so the National uh, Audiovisual National Institute in France. And here you have their video archives, and you can uh, see that there are many occurrences of recall. It is in France, within the perimeter of INA, which is related to the French audiovisual. And here you have um, the archiving of platforms like uh, YouTube or Vimeo. Or, so you can also see this timeline and talking about interfaces, the, uh, the um, archiving institutions are, are more and more providing also this kind of tools. Uh, we will see some yes of this uh, tools a bit later, but uh, this is a way also to change a bit uh, the, the scale and to look closer at this phenomenon short time in one uh, national uh, context. Here, because you can't mix the database of videos and of Twitter in INAs, and you can cross it, but you can't cross it online, you will have also this kind of uh, tendencies that are also uh, mirrored thanks to the archiving of Twitter by INA. Of course, you have just a part of uh, Twitter and of uh, the parameters that INA is uh, defining for the archiving of Twitter, which is very specific, and you have to uh, know exactly what they are uh, really uh, archiving. Um, uh, it is related to audiovisual accounts, journalist accounts, and so on. So not uh, all French Twitter or, of course, the whole Twitter, uh, Twitter sphere. 
So here we are with a question about heritageization and the challenges to retrieve memes through past and through uh, their uh, changes. Of course, there are, is a lot of noises. You have so many data, but at the same time, you have a lot of uh, silences too. And the first one is related to the fact that, for example, web archives are not especially targeting uh, virality or vernacular content. And even sometimes they try to deduplicate the collection. So you may imagine virality is about uh, duplication and circulation and, and noise. And this is not something which is so easy to, to manage uh, for web archivists. Uh, so at the beginning of the project, I will come back to it, but we were uh, totally uh, enthusiastic about the fact that we would work with web archives and the more we are going into the project, the more we are discovering that we absolutely need to cross the live web, some kind of platforms like Know Your Me, which are giant platforms, if I mention uh, Fortune, Reddit, and so on, you may imagine it's uh, quite impossible to have an overview of every part of uh, Reddit, for example. But you, you see that they, they are really playing a very important role, and uh, notably in the production beginning of memes. So you have to entwine live and archive uh, web. And uh, as historians, we like to cross also and triangulate sources. You can't also uh, miss uh, other media. And we are also trying to see the role that uh, press and other media are playing in uh, this uh, question. Uh, it is not so new. Jenkins, for example, with old and new media colliding, was already uh, into this kind of, of question. OK. So um, related to sources, we tried with uh, Fred Paillet, who is also uh, working with me on the project, to have a kind of typology of all the sources that we could use to, of course, retrieve uh, virality. And uh, as you can see, there are a lot of sources, but some are absolutely not possible to, to grasp. Uh, for example, what's happening on WhatsApp or Telegram is very difficult to uh, follow. Uh, nobody is archiving uh, WhatsApp, but it, it's almost the same problem, for example, with TikTok. At this stage, web archives may have uh, archiving of Twitter, Facebook. It's a bit, already a bit more complicated. TikTok. Instagram and the others. It started a bit during the COVID crisis, but it's very difficult to uh, uh, to, to archive. There are choices too. And uh, so this is also a question for the future. Uh, studying, for example, the web archives of the COVID crisis without uh, TikTok, does it make sense or not? What are we missing? Uh, and so on. There are other um, sources that are more uh, easy to track or to retrieve. Uh, for example, documentaries and series you may have seen on Netflix, uh, Clickbait, for example, or many documentaries were related to Britney Spears, uh, who is a queen for uh, uh, memes and virality and so on, from um, the Leave Britney Alone by Chris Croker um, a few years ago to the Free Britney Movement currently, uh, because of yeah, our problem with our dad and so on. Uh, Wikipedia, I will come back to it, but it's also a source which is uh, quite interesting to see also uh, some uh, yeah, uh, phenomenon of interest for a meme or an internet phenomenon. And uh, there is, also, of course, know your meme and others. But we have to be very cautious because they may seem to archive or heritageize uh, memes. And this is the case of uh, know Your Meme, which is a fascinating platform, but it's also a commercial player. And one who has several roles, documentation, edition, selection, search tool. Uh, know Your Meme is the probably most complete one, but this kind, and we come back to what John explained, of um, all this mediation roles that uh, Know Your Meme is playing is of course also uh, having a lot of impact about the selection and curation of, of memes. There is a good paper by uh, Petis, I can't remember his first name, but in internet stories related to uh, Know Your Meme and the way it is curated. And uh, we started to study all these platforms involved in heritageization of virality. Uh, it's awful if you look at it <laughs> at this stage, but uh, quite interesting. What we wanted to do is really to compare also the participation of public. 
the starting date, if there is a blog, a forum, the way also uh, memes and virality are selected, heritageized, and, and so on. So it's, uh, yeah, so 30 uh, entries or something like that, and we go deeper into, into details, but we were uh, quite interested in uh, making infrastructures, curation, and architectures of heritageization more visible. Because the more it is online, as Joanna demonstrated, the more uh, it's becoming in some ways invisible and you are trusting what's appearing on uh, the, the interface. We also were interested in Wikipedia. It's really, um, we just started what is already interesting, or we, Fred, just started actually. It's really Fred Paillet who started this work, but also to investigate uh, the way Wikipedia was mirroring internet phenomena. Uh, Wikipedia is very good at talking about uh, uh, problems related to computing and so on, because there is a lot of uh, yeah, uh, people interested in network computing, internet, and so on on Wikipedia. What is interesting is that it's more rich and interesting on the English pages. You have more categories, you have music memes, you have political internet memes, video game memes. In France, you have phenomena internet, internet phenomena, but you don't have all this kind of less uh, entries uh, within uh, yeah, the, the field of, of plurality. However, we have more than 2,000 uh, Wikipedia pages. It's not big data, but it's already uh, very interesting. No surprise, uh, all the references are, many of them are related to press, but it's just uh, related to Wikipedia. And the fact that references in Wikipedia are in generally based on uh, press, and it is asked for contributors to refer to this kind of uh, sources. But we will start to do some kind of network analysis. We can also, with this data, uh, conduct some sentiment analysis and so on to also try to reconstruct a bit uh, what uh, how Wikipedia and contributors are presenting memes. Those who are online, those who are not represented, and so on. And of course, what is also interesting, and here you have this tools, uh, tool Wikishar, is to see also um, the um, uh, audience of these pages. For example, it is very clear, I'm sorry in the room, because you have always this uh, tool that is appearing no. on, on, no. not on your computer, no. but no. for the, the others, it's not so clear. But for example, we made a search, just look at the Allen check. You see that uh, it's a uh, very short in time, but suddenly you have many, many people who are looking at the page, who wants to know more about it. And this is very uh, clear that at this time, you have a peak of virality in 2013, and a lot of people who want to know more about the Harlem Check, and that the interest is also very short in time, which is also a challenge for archiving, because web archivists uh, can't just uh, launch a crawler when something is happening. Or they are doing it for uh, the COVID crisis, for terrorist attacks, but not for the Harlem Check. Uh, we, we must, there are choices. Here, uh, I show you the interface of um, what is called uh, uh, Wikimaps, uh, which was developed by Boris Gold at uh, the University of Lausanne, UNIL. Uh, you can find more about it uh, on the link, um, yeah, on the other link. And it showed me how uh, it's also a visualization of what's happening on uh, Wikipedia, the audience of uh, web pages uh, of the Ice Bucket Challenge this time, and you have exactly the same. Phenomenon. A very short interest that you can see in Wikipedia. A lot of people reading and searching about the phenomenon and then it disappears very suddenly, which is not the case, for example, for the crawl, which is more uh, going through times and resisting uh, than um, probably the um, check. And what is interesting is that you can see also this in web archives. For example, here on Twitter, if you make a search, you see the exact same peak of tweets in France at the same time related to recall, just one day after. So it's interesting too, but you can really see how it may be translated through uh, several uh, platforms. Just a few words about uh, the uh, web archives. I already told you they are very uh, challenging for several reasons. First, uh, perimeters of web archiving. We are dealing with uh, transnational phenomena, but most of the web archives in 
uh, European countries are uh, related to national perimeter. So you have to follow your internet phenomena from France to Luxembourg, to Denmark, to uh, the UK web archives by moving from one to another archive. And of course you can't do it online because they are also also rights. And so you have to move from one library to another. And it's very difficult to cross all this uh, data. So there are transnational limits, but there are a lot of other problems. Searchability of this kind of phenomena. How do you search for some of them when it's uh, about an image that is eventually not defined as a recrawl or as an, uh, so it, it may be quite difficult. The question of ephemerality, when you run a collection of web archives two times per year, you may miss a lot of viral phenomena that just occur for one month or two. And so, and so I won't develop it too long because I want to come uh, to uh, another phenomenon uh, and notably to, to media. But uh, yeah, here you have a few examples. Of course, web archive miss a lot, but as you can see on the INA interface, and here it's uh, related to the RLM check, they also grasp a lot. You won't be exhaustive, but you have a lot of examples of occurrences of this kind of um, yeah, uh, myths. Uh, I, yeah, I just wanted to show you, and here it's very interesting and related to interfaces also, uh, the way with BNF we could access uh, data, metadata related to their collections, and uh, within uh, Data Labs, it just opened up a few months ago, and um, within a project which is related also to virality, but this kind, uh, this project is uh, entitled Buzz F, F stands for friends. And uh, we were searching about LibDub, uh, some things that happened before the Harlem Shake. LibDub was, uh, yeah, not so popular, but it's about, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, you have a song and you move your lips like you, were, you are singing the song. Exactly what is currently happening on TikTok. So you have a new kind of LibDub on TikTok. Talk, but at the time, uh, there were some lip dub, and uh, we wanted to compare the occurrences in web archives. It's just about web archives and not the live web of the time because not everything was uh, archived. But we wanted to compare lip dub and Alem Shek. And this kind of visualization is quite interesting. You can see also again that the Alem Shek is very well represented in web archives in 2013. But uh, if you do the same for meme and GIF, you will have also interesting results, but then you discover it that meme uh, was also um, used for meme with uh, yeah, an accent, uh, which means in French, same, and that all results were entirely wrong. So you have to be very cautious with this kind of tools that give you a decent reading overview that may be totally uh, false. So it doesn't work with uh, memes and GIF, for example. It's absolutely impossible. Why it is yeah, working better uh, with um, the Harlem Shake or the LibDub, because there are no equivalent uh, yeah, in the French language. And here's the kind of uh, sources of archives we are working with also, transforming also this kind of web archives into a lot of data and metadata that we can use. Use for what? For example, here is a visualization by um, um, an engineer and colleague from Imanum in France who is working with DNF and who was uh, making this kind of visualization of uh, LibDub in web archive. So you can also have a visualization of the websites. And here you see a lot of websites, top domain. They were created just to reflect about the LibDub. It doesn't mean that LibDub were not appearing in other kind of websites. But eventually, it's also more difficult to search them within web archives. And so you can also have a deforming mirror when you have this kind of results, but it may help to enter yeah, this kind of uh, viral uh, phenomenon. Uh, I should shorten or I should go very fast for the last uh, yeah, uh, 10 minutes or longer? No. no? Um, yes, 10 minutes, yes, Please. but uh, yeah, you ten can minutes. do what you want. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I could continue for the whole night. We can do a, a Nuit Blanche uh, yeah, uh, of memes, but another time. Uh, so what is also quite interesting in this kind of web archives is that you can also uh, look at, uh, yeah, uh, through facets, at 
uh, the um, uh, domain names that were the most represented for a phenomenon, like Alem Sheikh. And as you can see here, there is a lot of press, but it is no surprise. It is because I was also searching the collection Actuality, which is related to press. So I will just find press. And why was I searching within it? Because uh, all the collections by DNF are not um, searchable by plain text. So I can't search the whole web archive, but only a few collections. And this one, uh, it was feasible. So related to a uh, press. But what, what is interesting is that the most popular titles that are appearing are La Marseillaise, La Montagne.fr. Nobody knows about La Montagne.fr, but people, yeah, a few people, because it's not Le Monde or Libération. La Marseillaise, it's about also uh, South of France and Marseille. Uh, you don't read La Marseillaise, for example, in uh, Britain. So, and it's local press. And what is very interesting is to see the role of local press and news for this kind of international phenomenon, because it was happening at the IUT of Montbéliard, IUT of Limoges, IUT of, and there was a press cover related to this kind of, um, yeah, uh, performance. So here I move to my uh, last part uh, related to also media circulations. What is very interesting is to see all this relationship between traditional media that are no online, of course, there is press online and so on, but uh, what we could call traditional media, and of course this uh, viral phenomena on social platforms. And there are a lot of relationship between both. I will go very uh, fast. First, uh, to back to history to say that virality was already in a media before the digital. And for example, it is about uh, Domier, Philippon, and the others who were doing cartoons related to uh, Louis Philippe, uh, to the, the, the King Louis Philippe uh, in the 18th century. And then there were also uh, replicates, duplicates, and so on. So you just had to design a piece, and everybody. Uh, was aware that we were also joking about uh, the key. Other examples that you may find uh, here is a lot of references that you may then read if you are interested in the topic. Uh, this uh, paper is quite interesting about uh, the reuse and recycling of woodcuts uh, in woodcuts in the 17th century. Another one uh, by uh, Todd Thompson is about viral jokes and fugitive humor in the 19th century. Uh, so there, there were already a uh, kind of suitability of uh, humor and jokes and so on. Um, this rumor of uh, rumor clinics uh, is also quite interesting. It started in uh, 42 and uh, it was in the Boston era and it was about fake news. But here I should refer to Pascal Froissart who did uh, three days ago a wonderful uh, presentation related to this topic and the way remorse were also circulating through press and so on, um, of course, since a, a long time. So we can see a lot of viral phenomenon, uh, phenomena sorry, uh, through uh, media. What is quite interesting for historians is also that uh, uh, media of the past, even if painting is not exactly uh, 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 media, but are also reused in, in the present and in the current days on Twitter, for example. Here you have just uh, two uh, examples. And even medieval, for example, painting or tapestries. And it's very famous uh, tapestry uh, of Bayeux, for example, is a classic uh, for memes. And it started in 2002 with uh, German students developing a um, historic tale construction it using flash that allowed to create some memes related to uh, medieval times. And even if this uh, kit disappeared, it was uh, reborn on GitHub by passionate. So it's also about heritage, circulation, and, and so on. And this kind of medieval culture is also mixed with, for example, here you can see Beatles the Bad Core, hip hop and music like here you, if you want to enjoy Eminem through uh, medieval uh, instruments and so on, you will uh, find uh, them. Same uh, phenomenon, I really like Joseph Ducreux, a painter uh, from the 18th century, uh, who, is, um, uh, who became famous again thanks to this uh, self-portrait that was used of him. 
uh, mixing it with a rap song. And uh, so it is a, a genre in itself to use the Bucre and uh, this kind of, uh, yeah. And again, with Distracted Boyfriend, you can see a mixture, a strange mixture of use of the past, uh, media, the second one, media, video, uh, pop culture, which is at the center of memes and why uh, Distracted Boyfriend became famous because of the use of Phil Collins uh, at the center, looking at the pop. And it's at this time that this picture started to become uh, famous when they added yeah, Phil Collins uh, on it. What I want to show you is also that there were parallel with a film in 22 by Charlie Chaplin, Payday, and that some people on the internet said, oh, man, there was already a distracted boyfriend in this film by Chaplin. And you end up with the kind of mixture of Shapley within the meme distracted boyfriend and all this kind of construction of media uh, through uh, time. Uh, very short, I mentioned pop culture and Phil Collins, uh, but um, memes are very related also to other kind of uh, culture, like in Ali McBeal, you have the dancing baby who was regularly appearing uh, when uh, the um, Geologic clock of Ali McBeal was, uh, yeah, uh, running too, too fast. Grumpy Cat went to Hollywood because from Grumpy Cat, a uh, cat celebrity on the internet, uh, it became a film, but also a statue in Tussaud Museum and so on. So you have a lot also of, uh, yeah, of movement uh, through it. And uh, finally, and that will be uh, two minutes and then I, I stop. Um, so we started to also investigate how the press was playing a role in virality. Your idea was, because everybody is saying, okay, there is a mixture, it means it's vernacular, there is also, it's very bottom up, people are sharing and so on. But we also had the feeling that there was a kind of performative discourse by media that made also things. Uh, role. So studying a corpus of press articles in Europe press, English and French um, corpus, uh, Fred was able to show first that uh, finally after uh, a, a first success of GIF, it was memes who were more and more famous uh, in the press, more and more papers, and that it moved from a uh, specialized magazine like Mikuado and so on to very famous magazines like the New York Times. And that the New York Times is publishing more papers related to memes and GIF when there is an election, presidential election. Think about Trump and Pepe the Frog, for example, and all this kind of uh, uh, phenomena that are used during uh, this kind of electoral campaigns. But that also, uh, this development came also with the fact that the you know, New York Times was also opening a blog, trying to change its audience. So it's also related to internal strategies, of course, within uh, the press. But for sure, press is also um, making uh, things viral by echoing them with a very performative discourse, uh, saying, okay, uh, that's the uh, Alem Sheik, uh, that's uh, the successor of the Gangnam style. It's viral, it's very, uh, it's a viral dance and so on. And so it's explaining also why people are then clicking on Wikipedia to see the, the web page and, and so on. So I stopped there, I was already, I guess, uh, too long. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, after 10 months of a uh, research project, so probably in two years, we'll have more also to uh, put on the table, but I hope it may stimulate at least, uh, yeah, discussions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so you talked about the possibilities and difficulties uh, in studying uh, meme uh, from an historical point of view. And uh, I don't know if there are already questions, but I have a general question to, to begin. Um, do you already found some correlation between the history of media and the history of meme? For instance, uh, I think that social media have, uh, have, uh, um, have really uh, helped to, to, to Transfer meme uh, around around the world, and I, I was I was I would like to ask if 
uh, do you see already a specificity in social media meme compared to a previous form of meme on the internet? Can I say? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for these questions. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, um, one answer will be uh, first in sharing. It's very different that everything on social platforms is uh, done to stimulate this kind of sharing with uh, buttons and so on. That's why we are also so interested in this kind of architecture, the way uh, they are curating contents, they are also making them more visible and, and so on. Uh, for example, if you go back to uh, the dancing baby, uh, it was uh, first disseminated through emails by people, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, um, 96, even if people were interested. Uh, in France, we were just moving to uh, the web. It just started in the United States. It was a bit more developed, but it was really something more related to, I would say, the big uh, community. Mm -hmm. What has not changed is that, um, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of memes are also starting in communities like uh, on Reddit, on 4chan, and not uh, thanks to the general public at large. Uh, it's uh, a mistake. They are spreading memes, they are then transforming them. But uh, there is also, more generally, a strong relationship to, I would not say marginal communities, but very specific uh, communities. But of course, social media have developed this kind of uh, circulations. Um, and uh, what is very funny is uh, last time I, I was reading a paper uh, explaining that no uh, different memes are for boomers and that for teenagers it's a shame to see their parents and uh, my generation, for example, sharing GIF and memes. So uh, I'm not sure they will disappear, or, uh, but uh, it may also change from one platform to another. Um, mimetics phenomena will stay. Uh, it doesn't have to be a meme like a macro image. It may be something like I showed you in um, uh, TikTok is full of uh, mimetic uh, stuff, uh, but it's no more yeah, this kind of macro image and the meme as uh, I, I showed you. It's also changing through uh, generations, but as you see, the record is also able to uh, survive uh, since 2007. So some are very, uh, yeah, are also able to adapt. Um... Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Natalie that I'm actually curious to uh, are you um, working or you will maybe end up with a uh, with the definition of uh, variety? Or rather, because, because if you don't have it, you just to, you know, update it to phenomena of cross-references that may not belong to the digital era. So I just wonder. Mm. It, also because there is a different chronicity, right? Mm. I'm just wondering in connection with those yeah. nice peaks. I won't end up, I guess, with a definition of uh, virality, but with more a typology of virality, uh, I will say. Uh, defining it, many authors have started. Uh, it's very complicated. Uh, first, I, I, I talk about buzz, and people told me, oh, it's so, it was the word in the 90s, it was about buzz, it was not about virality. Uh, so the words are also changing. That's very interesting to follow them. Nobody was talking about viral content in the 90s, but there were a lot of plenty of books about how to do the best. Uh, one um, colleague that could really uh, talk about it is Gustavo Gomez Mega with online and make a systematic study of this kind of occurrence of buzz in the press. He will publish a paper uh, soon on the topic. Uh, so, but following this kind of uh, words is very interesting. A typology probably uh, saying, okay, um, there was this uh, time related to macro images. Um, for example, uh, someone who did it was, um, uh, I don't want to make a mistake about her name, but I think it's Travis in her history of cats online on the internet, where she's uh, doing a periodization of cats on the internet, starting with the first occurrence with, with uh, for example, Captain Memo and so on, and moving to cat celebrities and know what it's occurring and you have. So the problem is also that each phenomenon 
uh, each phenomenon may have its own periodization and definition. Uh, some things have changed with cats on the internet. For example, it was cute. It was also about cheeseburger and this platform that became tech moose thanks to cat. But during the terrorist attacks in Brussels, they used cats also to make noise on social networks, just to uh, prevent social networks from giving information to terrorists and so on. Uh, you saw also this phenomenon in uh, Asian countries in uh, some protests and so on, I can't remember, uh, posting food on uh, the networks to make noise and to also prevent from uh, finding information so that may help maybe policemen, terrorists, or it's of course not the same, but uh, yeah. Uh, so you have this kind of uh, sudden uh, things that may also totally change your definition. You know, I may define something as a, uh, something like and light and funny, like cats or recall, and suddenly uh, you have anonymous recalling Daesh. And, and so, and uh, yeah, and this definition, when you see all these controversies by Dawkins, Jenkins, Schiffman, Milner, and so on, I, I'm not sure I, I could find the right definition. I will probably, yeah, try to discuss all previous definitions, and that will be already a lot. But if we can have interesting typologies and periodizations, that would be wonderful, at least. But uh, yeah, <laughs> and thank you for the. Question. Do you have other questions for Valerie? There are two messages from Sofia Papastamku oh, and so Joanna. Okay. Um, probably there are no more questions. I would like to ask you something very marginal and peripheral, but um, I go, I go through. Um, so you know that. Uh, uh, I'm trained in art history and in semiotics, so my question will be a little bit probably not so interesting for you. I don't know. Um, for me, what is it? <laughs> we will see. We will see. We will see. No, but it's to say that um, when I when I look at the distracted boyfriend, uh, the Chaplin version, and so on. I think um, about the, what we spoke before uh, during lunch, uh, that is uh, how um, 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 uh, how can a small figure, local figure, like uh, for instance uh, uh, Trump uh, that replaces the um, the boyfriend or another actor or a chaplain himself um, how the local um, actor uh, how the local um, person can change the globality of the image and of the frame uh, because um, I don't know the, the, the literature on minutes <laughs> but I always uh, um, have the impression that uh, we um, we pay attention to the repetition, yes, but not to the changes, not to the deformation, mm -hmm. not only the deformation of sense, of signification, of meaning, that is very important, mm -hmm. but the um, uh, changing of the world composition, you know? Mm -hmm. So how can you... Uh, put in relation the local replace, um, replacement, the uh, remplacement, um, with the global effect uh, of the image, of the frame. Mm. It's a problem that is important for you. Uh, it's not at all important, but for visuality, it's more important than mm. for uh, the um, song that um, uh, uh, can be uh, repeated in a, in a political discourse and so on. Because uh, with image, you have um, a, simul a surface a simulta a simul that we have to, to read simultaneously, in the sense that we, we have an immediate uh, impression, even if uh, you have to read the image uh, a long time. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, you, you have to, you have to. You, to take account uh, of the problem of the 
global is the wholeness, the, 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 the unity uh, and, uh, of this heterogeneity uh, that changes the, the meaning of the, of the mm -hmm. world. So local and global, but not yeah. local and global in the sense of stream, streaming and um, peripheral or marginal, but mm -hmm. uh, local and in composition. Uh, so it's an interesting question. It is why we need interdisciplinarity in these uh, studies of memes. And this has been studied in some ways, but for a very uh, unique phenomenon. Yeah. There is not this global vision to come to it. Uh, that will also uh, bring up a bit more of theory about it, because just Putting a name on the distracted boyfriend, even not the face of Trump, but just Phil Collins, yeah. using one kind of typo or another, just turning the image, the size of the macro image, everything uh, may change the, also the meaning of uh, the, the, the image and of the, of the meme. So it's, it's really very important. And even with uh, songs, uh, for example, adding Eminem a play by a medieval mm -hmm. instrument uh, will entirely change. You don't have to look at uh, yeah, uh, the um, interface or everything to see that uh, or to hear that it's also a transformation and mix. So it's, it's also very interesting. I would say for us, it's of course of interest, but here we trust uh, semioticians, art historians and so on, who are very uh, well equipped to do this kind of things uh, to help us, uh, because uh, it has started with this kind of uh, studies, but really uh, based on one uh, or two uh, phenomena, but to, to draw a bigger picture that we can also uh, complete with uh, all that, all we can bring about context, temporalities, affordances, and so on. Um, this is why, for me, yeah, really, uh, memes are about interdisciplinarity. It's uh, really something that we can't do alone, mm -hmm. uh, but really by uh, crossing, uh, yeah, or, or, mm -hmm. or visions. Mm -hmm. But I fully agree with you that it's really, yeah, the transformation. And this is also something which is making uh, it uh, more difficult to retrieve in web archives and so on, uh, because uh, searching an image which is always transforming, uh, how, how do yes. you do? Yes. Uh, it, it's quite complicated. And it's often based this kind of searchability on text. If it was tag distracted boyfriend, even if it's uh, Chaplin or Trump on it or not. So the way you tag it, the way you refer to mm -hmm. the original, if there is an original, and in this case, it was a picture, a commercial picture, which is also interesting, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, no. Uh... Yes, yes, because I think that um, these course analysts uh, can be re useful, yes, mm -hmm. because they, they are probably uh, less interested in the process of virality and uh, in the um, uh, conquest of different media, mm. uh, but more uh, interested in uh, uh, the, um, the relation between the detail, the detail, and the, um, the changing of the of the of the entire uh, organization of the text mm. uh, in a special uh, in a special. Uh, in special terms, especially for mm -hmm. photos and images that are visual. And last uh, but not least, but why it is also important, you, you brought, of course, visual culture into the discussion. Uh, what is very important is also that we have studied the web a lot based on text. Finally, it is also something that we are no, not discovering, but that it's a lot about mm. audio, about visual mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. and that you can't enter the main cultures based on text, and that to focus, uh, for example, in Joseph Ducreux, just on the words that are changing, yes, is yes. not e enough, of course, and mm. this is not what is meaningful, and that we really need to take care of these uh, mm -hmm. visual cultures mm -hmm. that are developing here yeah, mm -hmm. uh, online. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Valérie. Thank you so much. So, 
here in the room, uh, we are satisfied and we don't <laughs> do not uh, have a question anymore, but uh, probably you at home, do you have more questions for uh, Valerie? I think uh, not. So it was a great pleasure uh, to listen to Joanna, to listen to Valerie, to make them meet as well. And um, all our discussions, I hope uh, they will be fruitful in the future. Um, so thanks to everyone. Uh, we'll have the recording, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll diffuse the recording um, through Facebook in some days, so you can uh, listen to us again <laughs> if you want. <laughs> and thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao, ciao, ciao. I miss... Ah, okay. The, the, yeah, the questions, the chat. Oh, thank you, Gustavo. <laughs> it was great to see you so again. Uh, but, uh, yeah, even off online, but, uh, yeah. Il nous reste l'idée, il ne faut pas oublier deux idées surgies pendant, pendant la séance. Maria Julia doit faire un roman sur la résurrection oh, oh, oh. de Julia Christina. Et Valérie a évoqué une nuit blanche sur les mêmes. Ça, c'est une très bonne idée. C'est génial. Et bien, Gustave, on t'engage tout de suite. Hein. On va faire son et, euh, Ça serait fabuleux. Hein. On y réfléchit. On a les bons formats. Il n'y a plus qu'à choisir. Ça, ça serait excellent, franchement. Ça, La nuit blanche des mêmes. Moi, par contre, pas de, pas de romain. Ça, <rire> on, on y réfléchit. Merci beaucoup. Ah, Bonne soirée à vous. C'était un plaisir de te revoir. Hein. À la prochaine. Un plaisir. Au revoir. Merci. Ok. <laughs>